Good morning, everyone. This is Louise Savela with Rails. I'm the Consulting and Continuing Education Specialist. And thank you for joining us for part two of our webinar called How to Discuss eBooks with Your Patrons, uh, presented by Phil Spirito. I'll turn over the reins to him in just a moment. I just want to make a few announcements. Uh, just a few technical announcements first. Um, everyone in the audience is muted. If you have any questions for me or for Phil, there's a questions box that I'll be keeping an eye on and answering uh, throughout the presentation and sharing those with Phil. If your audio is not working, uh, check you know your speakers and volume, make sure everything's plugged in and operating. Uh, if you're calling in on the phone, uh, make sure to enter both the access code and a PIN, and that should help. And if beyond that, if, if you have trouble, maybe try logging out and logging back in again and see if that works. Um, we are recording the session. Uh, part one was last week, and that recording is up on the Rails website. I'm going to paste the link into the chat so that you can have it. And uh, we'll be... Uh, uploading the recording for this pr program in a few days and thank you to Phil for allowing us to record it and archive it. Um, and then if you can't see your control panel um, for the webinar there's a orange arrow button that allows you to expand it and collapse it and um, when it's expanded then you'll see that question box we can add your questions. So I'm going to go ahead and um, turn things over to Phil and um, enjoy. Should be seeing. All right. Good morning, Phil. Everybody should be seeing my slides here. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody I can assume can see my slides up on the screen? Um, just to review sort of what we're going to be doing today is really we're going to be focusing primarily on the resources today. So last week we talked about the general process and, and tips, ideas to do better technology, e-resource, e-media training and assistance. And today we're really going to just be focusing on the resources. We're going to start with OverDrive and which we're going to take probably the most time with. Then we'll cover uh, Access 360, Hoopla, 3M, and probably a little bit of Freeding. And then we'll talk about some stuff that might be coming in the future or might be already here. So depending on your library, of course. <clears throat> so let's get started. And just before we launch, <laughs> just after I contradict myself, before we launch into the resources, let's just talk a little bit about now we're at the resources, and I sort of break each resource down into three steps. <clears throat> so part one is really the setup. So basically, uh, we're going from cold, no-use training here. Basically, what do we do first? We're going to have to set up the application, the resource for them, which obviously means getting, depending on the type of resource, it usually means some kind of account setup, username and password, coupled with uh, logging in and associating your library account with that situation, and then any other setup stuff that you might want to do in the beginning <clears throat> that you can do before you get going. Some of this occurs later also if we're talking about font enlargement or other stuff. Next to next part of the process, uh, part two, is the actual process of getting the books. And here's that flowchart again from last week. You know, it's just an example of what the flowchart can look like. Again, if anybody's interested, the, uh, the flowchart and the slides will be available. I'll make sure Louise has them and can post them after this, as well as the name of the, the free flowchart creator, which maybe some of you guys already figured out. So that's the process. How do we get the book onto the device, or how do they get a book? Part three, it, which I think is possibly the most important, as we discussed over and over last week, is how do we get them to retain this information? How do we help the patron to have a successful training, and how do we help them 
to be able to do this process again. As, a, as we all know and have figured out, some people are going to need two or three times help, assistance situations. Some people hopefully get it in the beginning, but here's some steps and some tricks that we can do to really help them retain that. And first, so before we launch into part one and two, which we're going to do a little bit more when we get into the resources, I'm just going to talk a little bit about retention and some strategies for assisting retention. Of course, we talked last week a lot about, or I should say I talked, <laughs> about note-taking and assisting them in note-taking and practice. Well, when we're starting to think about the reasons why we do that and how we can help them, I always like to look at this learning period and you know this is an old model but it's still just as true today and if you look at the top obviously listening to somebody tell you how something to do is is near zero you know as far as retention goes and as you get down you know reading how to do something watching somebody tell you how to do something with audio um, a demonstration discussion practice doing obviously 75 percent the highest retention percentage for the learning period as everybody can see here is teaching others you know and I've found that when you're having a kind of a more um, when you have a class where you're describing stuff if you can if you can have the smarter patrons t teaching the people that are having a harder time getting the the concepts that is going to really help drive it home for those some of those people so you know helping them teach others is great you know encourage people that you know to spread the word i you know talked all about promotion last week i sprinkle it in to all my kind of thoughts and discussions about libraries but you know telling people to spread the word and teach others is help, very helpful for them, but obviously it also helps promote the resources for the library. But you know, oftentimes when you're done showing somebody, they say, that's great, I never knew that existed. Well, I always couple that with, well, great, tell your friends and show them how to use it. You know, and, and that's just kind of driving home that message that teaching others is really going to help them to solidify the process in their brain. You know, we have to always remember, too, the problem is with e-resources, and I think we never really acknowledge this fact is people take between, you know, depending on what how fast they read, it might be two to four to longer weeks before they get back to downloading another book. Now, if you think about it, for an average person, two weeks between doing a process that they've just learned is a long time. So, you know, another thing that we, you know, in the practice doing section, I encourage people to download books even if they don't want to read them. So I'd say, you know, for the first couple of weeks, do this every other day, you know, and, and they get on average 10 to 15 books, you know, at a time, depending on how your library works. You know, but we're very generous with our ebooks. They only last two to three weeks. So, you know, I tell people, don't worry if you're not going to read it. Just download something that is that you don't even care about and just practice doing it, practice downloading it. And that way, when you're actually ready for another real book, you're going to be able to remember that. So let's see, how do eBooks work? Well, we've all followed the controversy and it's really obviously calmed down a lot at this point, or I should say people are really ignoring it basically at this point because there's other hot button issues going on. The reality is, is the, the publishers control the the instance of the ebook and they decide the process that they want to provide and that is basically what the the resources overdrive 3m etc that is that, that they basically agree to do whatever the publishers say in order to provide those books for us now we all have the argument and, and, you know, for years, Overdrive was the only game in town, as many of you remember. And a lot of us felt really, and we'll get to this later on this, a later slide, 
that OverDrive was never advocating very well for libraries. They seemed to always be on the side of the publisher, which is odd because we are one of the biggest purchasers of books. <laughs> you know, so it's interesting that they don't um, they don't advocate for us more. But it's not it's not that surprising, you know because they're a company and they want to make money, obviously. So, you know, we, the, the libraries buy an instance of, of an ebook and that ebook is just like a physical book. I find that it's very important to, to uh, explain this to patrons because patrons still think, well, it's a digital book. Why do you only have two copies of it? Why don't you have unlimited copies? So it's important to explain to them right up front why that is. And, you know, obviously the reason is, is that, a digital book never deteriorates. You know, with a physical book, you may get, if it's popular, you may get 20 or 30 checkouts, depending on the how hard on the book people were. You know, with a digital book, it lasts forever. So, you know, we the publishers, they need to feel confident that their, you know, e-books are being fairly used. And we're not going to get into the discussion of <laughs> whether we agree with that or not. And you can go to do research on any number of, um, you know, w library people who speak out freely about any of these topics. And I agree with some and disagree with others. And you can pick your battles. And the reality is at this point we want to provide these books for people to use. We need to provide them for free because that's what libraries do. And the reality is we need to make it as easy for people as possible. I'm not really that interested in spending time trying to convince companies to take make less money, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, I want them to treat us fairly. And in that way, we need to just know how these things work and, and follow along when we see discussions about, you know, the big publishers getting together to make these decisions about ebooks and libraries. So it's important. So that being said, digital rights media is one of the ways that publishers have control over ebooks to guarantee, and basically the simple explanation of this is to guarantee that the person using the book is just using that one instance of the book. And one of the main ways to do that for libraries has been your Adobe ID. The Adobe ID, as many of you know, in the early days that was very frustrating. It's getting a little less frustrating these days, but it still exists out there. It's just one more step where you know you need to take the person you know through setting up yet another account before they can actually go back and you you know and enter it in and authenticate the application they're using. And this can be. Um, very daunting for some users, as we know. The, the reality is, is sometimes setting up one account is just about all that somebody can do, let alone trying to get them to go and enter all their information all over again. Considering if this is a smartphone even, you know, you, you may be put, pushing that person over the edge. And you should be able to sense that. As we talked last week, you watch, we all need to watch for these kind of the people that are already frustrated, and then you tell them, oh, well, you just created an account, and now, now you need to create another account to get this identification to prove who you are. Sometimes this can push people over the edge. So we just need to be sensitive to that fact. And the reality is, is by being sensitive, sometimes that might mean that you might just drive for a minute and help them get their Adobe ID so you can get them back on track. I don't, I don't recommend that we drive all the time, and in fact, is we should drive as little as possible for our patrons when training them, but sometimes that's going to be the difference between them finishing the training session or not, you know, and I, I'm always sensitive to that fact. My main goal in any training for e-resources is to get them the material, so I want them to have that book that they want or audio book or, no, or whatever it is that they need. I, that's my goal. And if that means we need to drive to help them get their Adobe ID, that's what, we're, that's what I'm going to do. You know, there's a lot of talk in library world about DM, DRM free books. I'm not sure that's going to happen for libraries. You know, the, the, 
it's a so it's such a complicated issue, and we're not going to discuss it too much here. But you know, reality is authors need to make money, you know, and they used to make more money, and it's hard for them to sell books these days because you know, when the new bestseller books are pirated and already available in Russia before they're even released over here, that means those books are out there in the world for anybody to download. You know, and I, I mean, I, at my old library, I had a, a couple Russian patrons who wanted me to show them <laughs> how to move pirated books onto their Nook devices, and that was a very that was a big that was a big controversy for me because I wanted to help them with technology and I wanted to help them to be able to use eBooks, but I didn't want them to help. I did not want to help them do something illegal, so I basically showed them how to use their Nooks. And I showed them how to use the library resources, and I said, "Well, if you need to use those, you're going to have. If you, if you want to use these illegal pirating sites, you're going to have to talk to somebody else. You know, talk to your son or daughter or or something, so they can help you. But these, you know, the, those kind of gray areas we have to be careful in. It's not like I was afraid that I was going to get arrested or that I was going to, or somebody was going to come and uh, slap my hand. I was more concerned about the just the ethical problem there so anyways so where are we at these days with e-resources well we've come a long way and really basically where we're at right now is we're in almost a completely app driven world and um, you know what we'll get to that question in a second about the Adobe ID and because that's getting a little complicated right now, but we'll we'll talk about that in just a second about the Adobe ID and OverDrive. So we're 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 primarily today going to be talking about app the app for each resource and how that works. There is still a lot of people or a fair amount of people out there who may be moving books onto a physical device, a, an old Nook or possibly even a super old Kindle, but primarily these days I'm finding that almost every time I'm doing an e-resource training or somebody on my staff is, it's always going to be app-based, unless it's Kindle. And and so, you know, we're going to talk about Kindle first here in OverDrive and, and move on from there, but after that we're really going to be focusing on apps. And, you know, this is where it's going. This is the future is is all our e-resources are going to be app driven and you know so it goes back to my comment from last week about you know smartphone use and you know some some of the a lot of the patrons that we're helping these days they might not even have a computer anymore you know so their their computer is their smartphone and that, and that is what they do everything on and so we should get used to that that's the world we're living in now and we need to be digital natives of the app world. So if you're not there yet, you know, try to make yourself comfortable with, you know, iOS first or Android first and 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 then move on to the others. You know, I I'd, I'd say focus on those two right now. The Microsoft phone does not really have very many apps for us. So I'd say we don't need to worry about that, but if you focus on Android and Apple, I think you're doing pretty good. So now let's get in, we're launch right into OverDrive. So love it or hate it, some of us who have been doing this for a while mostly hate it and and wonder why they still are trying to frustrate us as much as they are. But the reality is is that OverDrive is the is still the number one player. And for most of us, even though we have multiple e-resources, OverDrive is still, because it's our oldest resource, contains the biggest collection. So if my goal is to get somebody a book, oftentimes my goal is to show them OverDrive. I've had staff in the past, in my past libraries, who would just skip over OverDrive and show somebody an easier resource because they felt that was a easier way to go. But the reality is, I'm not saying you need to start with OverDrive, but if you want that person to get the book that they want, Sometimes it only lives in OverDrive, and hopefully our Access 360 or our 3M collections, Hoopla, are catching up. But OverDrive still contains a lot of it, and you know, again, they are app-driven now, but it's still pretty frustrating to use and set up for most people. 
So let's talk about it a little bit. And be before we get into Kindle, I'm just going to address Darlene's question. Um, these days with OverDrive, you need to set up an Adobe account, uh, not an Adobe, but you need to set up an OverDrive account first. And that account actually is the is the um, authentication system. So once you do that, you don't need to get an Adobe ID with OverDrive anymore. But um, you do need to set up that account. And again, you know, I I have found ways to kind of get around that, depending on how you're doing it. But the but the reality is, pretty much these days, you need to. Um, set up an OverDrive account with them. And basically that's a username and password. And these days, I believe every one of the resources that we use, that when we're talking about it, whether it's 3M, whether it's um, OverDrive, whether it's Hoopla, I believe Access 360, they're all asking us to create an account. And that account generally is a username, which is an email and a password. Now we I've had arguments with not arguments but um, what I generally tell people is use your for your username and password use your email and the password you use for that email. Now this you know as far as security goes I think everybody needs specialized passwords for sensitive logins. But if we're talking about um, ebook resources or you know other kind of low tech stuff anything that's not going to be creating security issues for you I tell people to just use their username as their email and use the same password they use for their email and basically that helps people just to not have so many passwords you know, people are so freaked out that they, uh, by what they hear on the media and what they hear on TV, that they feel like they need a new password for everything. And we all know that that basically causes so much heartache for, especially people that are of have low technology skills. But even for people that have high technology skills, who are are, are fearful of being having their identity stolen. But, you know, the reality is, is somebody going to steal your identity from your OverDrive account? No. From your library account? No, they're not. You know, libraries, you know, they, they don't save any of that, the social security information or any of that. So now I may have some of you who disagree with me here about that, but it, it just makes it simple, you know, for people to be able to, to create a username and password quickly because, you know, really, that's what they need to do. They need to just get through that section so they can feel comfortable and move on to the next thing. So when it comes to username and password or setting up accounts, that's what I recommend to people, and, and hopefully they move on from there. So Kindle, as we know, is basically libraries, for those of you who have been around this for a while, when OverDrive was the only game in town and Kindle was exploding and basically everybody had a Kindle and and Kindle did not want to play nice with libraries, we were all kind of sitting back wondering what was going to happen. Well, what happened is Jeff Bezos, the genius, insane, um, <laughs> whatever you want to call him, person of business, Basically, evil overlord. You can you can all come up with your own terms. Super smart, whatever. He figured out exactly how he wanted ebooks to work from libraries. He made it go through his website. He made OverDrive agree to let Amazon send, as we all know, send emails to our patrons that say your ebook is expiring from the library. Do you want to buy it from Amazon? Here's a link. You know, basically he had overdrive over a barrel, I assume, and they agreed to everything. So as we know now, basically you go on your overdrive page and you can see the little uh, JPEG here. You go on your overdrive page, you check out your book, you choose Kindle book, you press download, it takes you to your Amazon page where if you're logged into your Amazon, it automatically 
goes to the orange button on the right that says get your Kindle book. All you need to do is look underneath that. If you have more than one Kindle, make sure it's going on the correct Kindle. And if it is, you push get library book and over Wi-Fi, as long as you're in Wi-Fi zone, the book downloads to your Kindle in about 30 seconds. Now, is that amazing for our patrons? That service is amazing. It's quick, it's easy, and it's fast, and they can do it pretty much. Now, you know, obviously, if, before I even do a Kindle training, I make sure to ask the person to make sure they have their Amazon username and password because they're going to need that in order to get the books. Now, you know, we've all encountered the same thing about what um, happens with people who come in for a training and don't even know what their Amazon login is. Sometimes they come in with a brand new, um, <laughs> they'll come in with a brand new Kindle in the box and have not even set it up yet. You know, so these are all things that we have to be prepared for and and try to figure out what that is. So, um, but really easily figured out because the Kindle really, once you get your overdrive set up and logged into, and, and I that's a situation where you don't even have to go to the app. You can do that just online and and that, you know, and I think that's probably one of those situations where you don't even need an account. You just, because Kindle, uh, Amazon authenticates your account for you. So you can go to the overdrive, you can log in, you can just go into the browser of the OverDrive page of your library, log in with your library card, check out the book, push it over, you know, download button, push it over to the Amazon page, and then you're all set. So that's one of those situations where you wouldn't need an, an account. But if you're using the app straight up, if once you open your book, you, just to get in there, you need to create an account. And of course, if you're a first-time user of the OverDrive app, one of the also annoying things for me is that it asks you, if you want, you can log in with your Facebook account, which I personally don't use that. I don't use my Facebook account to log into anything, but some people like everything to be associated with each other. And if, you, if your patron does, and if they know what that is, then you can tell them that they can just do that. The other thing that that is a tricky and slippery slope is by using your Facebook account, they don't have to set up an account. So that's for some people that is a real bonus, you know, but again, we have to remember. So let's just go past the Kindle and again, you know, when we're talking about the authentication or creating an account, this this is sort of the the old way that it used to happen you used to have to actually create your Adobe account and then go in here and enter it. And then now what we have is basically creating an Adobe or creating an OverDrive account, which is creating that authentication of the DRM for you. So did uh, Tina, did I answer your question? Are you, you seem to be curious about Darlene's question. If you can put more information in there, we can talk about that a little bit. So once you get into the OverDrive app, you can see that basically you have the, the little lines, which you can see sort of in the top middle of this picture. Those three lines are the, sort of the universal um, sign for more information, basically, or how do I get to, my, to, to another menu? So that's kind of a general idea for menus. And you can see here, the, there's the main, the, the main two parts of OverDrive now are you have the above the line where you have your libraries collection, and then you have the below the line stuff in your menu. And you can see all that at the bottom there, you can see is the book you're currently reading. On the right, you can see right here what I've, I've highlighted, or the menu I'm looking at here is the bookshelf. And you can see the two books that are in my bookshelf here. So the first thing you're going to do after you help them create their account is you're going to 
add a library by pushing that plus button. You can see in here I had at the time loaded in the, the North Suburban Digital Consortium. Once you add your library in there, it's going to take, and you click on it, it's going to take you to the library's it's going to take you to the library's web page inside the browser. Now in there is where you're going to put your library card and PIN number, or in some cases just your library card. And once you've logged in, you'll see and, and clicked on a book, this is kind of the screen you'll see. Now at the top right in the cloud, in the pretty clouds area, you'll see another menu button, an account button, and help and the search button, the you know, search field there. Now that account button, and this is where things get confusing for, for our patrons, that account button is inside the library's web page and in there you'll see this. So you'll see on the top bookshelf, then you'll see holds, and then there's a place for you to create book lists, and then there's settings. Now what confuses patrons is they think when they're in here that this is the bookshelf is where their books are going to be. But in actuality, we all know that the books that they're about to read are out back in the app in that bookshelf on the left. So you can see this confusion. So the way I try to explain it to people is the bookshelf that's in here is, is the books you've checked out. And you can see the ones that you've downloaded or not, and you can then make them that you can download them. And when you download them, they go into your outlook, your bookshelf that's actually in the app. So I try to explain it as when you're in here, you're actually in the website of the library. When you're out here, you're in the app on your phone. We can all come up with different ways to. <laughs> to explain that and it's it, it just gets very complicated for people another thing that's very frustrating for people is they see the download button and they see the read in your browser button and they think oh read that's what I'm gonna do and they push that and it opens up but it's it's only available during for Wi-Fi because you're reading it in your browser so they they leave the Wi-Fi area and then they can't read their book and they wonder why so again, we need to, when we're training people, remind them that really downloading the book into the app is what they want to do. Reading in your browser, I'm not even sure why that why OverDrive puts that in there because it, it is not something that I understand as being useful for people. But again, I think it's a little bit of a dinosaur in that they may have put it in there because they thought people were going to be reading in the browsers on their computers but I'm still not quite sure why that is in there. So that's the thing. Um, the, that's a great question. Do you still have to create an AD account for, for the Nook? If you're using Adobe Digital Editions, which some people still are, the Adobe Digital Editions is the application that you would use on the desktop to move books to the Nook black and white, then you will have to create an Adobe ID to authenticate that software. If you don't know what I'm talking about or, or you're not with me, this the Adobe Digital Editions software is really, I'm seeing it less and less and at this point I, I haven't done one in over a year. That doesn't mean it's not out there. So you know, keep in mind that there are there still are people. That means you have to download that software to the desktop of the person. They're going to read that that book on their Nook. So they'll have to plug their Nook in, associate the Nook with the um, with the computer and software that you're using, it's quite an extensive process. You know, you're not going to. I don't think you're going to encounter it that much, but it, you will need an Adobe account to authenticate that. Yes, I know that read in your browser is for those of us who don't have smartphones. It's true, and I'm sorry. I, I'm not trying to be elitist about smartphone use, obviously, but. More and more people are going to have them, and and uh, you know, again, we all need to learn how to use them, even if we don't have them, because we have to help our patrons. 
So hopefully your library has a tablet or, or something else where they can uh, help you learn. So anyways, you can see that, that once you pick out your book, you hit the borrow button. You might see at, on this um, screen the buy it now button, which I'm not really in favor of, but it's OverDrive and some other resources have offered that service. <clears throat> the library gets a percentage of the sale but I, I don't think we're in the habit of selling things, so I'll leave you to that ethical question. So once you've downloaded your book, you can see you can choose the Adobe EPUB or Kindle book. As I said before, if you choose Kindle book here, it would pop you into the Amazon web page. If you choose Adobe, you confirm and download, and then the book will appear back out in your bookshelf in the app, again, not in the bookshelf that's inside the OverDrive web page. This I mentioned this last week. This is the uh, this is what the Gutenberg Free Library looks like inside the OverDrive page. And again, you can see it just has download buttons. So if you download the book, it ends up in your your bookshelf out in the app, and it stays there until you de delete it. Do we have any questions about OverDrive before we move on here? Okay. So again, now we're going to talk about 3M Cloud Library. I think most of us were very excited about the fact. Sorry, there was a couple more comments here. Oh, that's that's interesting. I yeah, I guess I was a little bit wrong about OverDrive Read. Does it cache the whole book, or does it just cache what you're uh, like a portion of the book? So anybody wants to catch up, catch me up on that? I guess I was being a little uh, drastic about the read situation. Um, so 3M Cloud Library, let's talk about that a little bit. We we're all happy when 3M Cloud Library came along, I think, because it was a, a much easier to use interface for people and it, it basically, what we want in a good app for anything is we want something that's going to really contain everything that we need to do in the app itself and to make it as easy to do as possible and and 3M has really done that and unlike some resources I think that they have really very quickly figured out what library what's great for library patrons and what they want and every time they do an upgrade I think this this app is just getting better and better and they have they talk to libraries a lot which is great and I think that's very helpful so that's good news. The whole book can be cached. And let me just, we have a couple more OverDrive questions that we'll just, how can you tell how many holds for an item for your individual library versus the consortium in OverDrive? And can you renew an OverDrive book using the smartphone app? So the answer to the number one, how can you tell how many holds for an item for your individual library versus the consortium, it really, it really depends on your library and it depends on the Advantage program also. So if you're a part of a consortium, which a lot of Illinois libraries are, the consortium controls the amount, you know, basically the consortium is as many holds for the whole consortium. Your, your library does not own any individual copies unless you purchase them through the Advantage program. And the Advantage program is basically a program that allows each library within a consortium to buy additional copies of eBooks that only their patrons can check out. So in that way, you would, you would only, you would see it appears a little differently under the book if your if your library has the advantage program if it doesn't then you share that those holds with it with the whole consortium and that that's one of the biggest problems I thought and again another love it hate it thing about overdrive is they basically just told libraries 
that they were going to be part of consortiums. Libraries in the beginning didn't even have a choice. They just, they just created these consortiums. And in some cases, these consortiums were huge, you know, with, with tons of libraries in them. And for a littler library who couldn't afford to have their own overdrive account, this was one of the only ways they could do it. And what it caused is incredibly long hold times. And so, you know, patrons wondered, why do I even bother if I have to wait for three months to get a copy of an ebook? And the, and the answer to the other one is, you yes, you can renew the, the, the book if renewals are available for that book. Not every book in OverDrive has renewals available or returns for that matter. So 3M Cloud Library, again, it's this is a really simple interface. You click connect to my library on the left picture, you choose your country, you choose your library on the left picture, on the right, you enter your library card and PIN, and then what? how 3M got past the DRM stuff is, they just tell you here to accept the agreement, and the agreement says that I am who I am, and I'm using these eBooks. If anybody reads the end user agreement, that's basically what it's saying. And once you get it, once you've accepted that, you're all set for 3M. You're ready to go. You're in there, and it starts you off right with a. The, again, there's the three lines that open this menu, and this menu is featured browse my books which is the bookshelf where the books you've downloaded are and then setter settings filters etc so if we come in here into featured you can see that it's featured as a nice sort of lists and lists of books depending you know with different classifications not created by you your library if you have 3m can add to the uh, the featured and create their own featured lists, which I think is great. It just allows us to be have a more personal touch on the resource. And you can see on the right here that you've I've chosen a book and there's the green borrow button. Once you borrow it, it opens up automatically into the first page of the book. The nice thing about this new the the newest um, this is a new, what can, what can I say, the newest upgrade to 3M here, and I think this new app is great. It, it's really a, even more user-friendly, and, and again, as we discussed last week, one of the main reasons our patrons are using eBooks is because of the font and being able to adjust the font size. And you can see right here, the, the nice thing is, is that the, the font adjustment button is right there. It's very clear, and right beside that's the bookmark, and again, right beside that is the three lines which indicate the menu. The menu is nice. It's a very simple, within the book, the menu gives you all these different options that you can quickly get to. Another an important one, obviously, in apps is the lock rotation. Nothing more annoying than leaning over to lie on the couch when you're reading a book and having that that screen rotate. So, you know, that's all in there. And again, they also have a brightness uh, toggle right there at the bottom. So I think this is really easy to use for patrons. And again, it's all right there. So it's 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 makes it for them not challenging. They they can. It's kind of a no-brainer. Another nice uh, feature here in the browse section is these days they created this thing where you can actually star different categories. And so in here you can see there's a kind of a scroll situation right under where that when you star a category is and you can scroll through that list of categories that you can see on the right. And when I clicked on literary, I touched the star button, and the star button basically makes literary into one of my featured browse lists. So that, so for people, this is nice because there's a lot of categories in there, and people may not all want to read legal, uh, read legal books or mashups. So it's nice for them to be able to choose the the browse categories that are going to be the ones they're looking at.
I'm not sure what are we talking about. So I saw the number of holds, which is great. Thanks for that comment. Please, everybody, comment if you have more information. I'm not perfect and can't keep up with every little change, but it's good that the holds are being shown. <clears throat> and I'm not sure, uh, is the question about AT&T have to do with 3M? I'm not sure if there is an association with any overdrive or 3M. 3M, as we do know, is a giant corporation who basically start out by making tape and now have makes a lot of stuff. But they also make a lot of stuff for libraries. They make uh, a lot of our um, automated check-in equipment. So once you've starred your category, that's a great thing for people. And then it's just personalizing the app for them. The other thing under settings is the, the view you can change, and I think this is, is great, is you want to be able to tell people that if they want books, they can search all titles, which allows them to see everything, even stuff that's checked out, and they can place holds, but sometimes they just want to see all available. What's really nice about, about um, 3M is they have a suggestions for the library search also, and what that is is it shows all the books that are available through 3M, even if your library has not purchased those books. So if you see a book that is not in your current library catalog, you can actually send a suggestion to the library and the buyer, and, and oftentimes in past libraries that I've worked at, they can see that quickly and and by doing that, they can purchase the book that the person wants almost spontaneously. So it happens very quickly, which is nice because it's hard for most libraries to respond to purchase requests that quickly. But with eBooks, we want to be as, as responsive as possible. And so if your library doesn't have that feature, I'd say advocate for it because it, it basically creates an almost spontaneous situation where we can provide those ebooks for people depending on our budgets almost immediately. So that's 3M. It's pretty easy and quick and now let's just talk quickly about another super amazing resource that I'm hoping many libraries are getting into these days and if you're not at least you'll hear about it and hopefully your library We'll get into it in the future. Hoopla is the digital resource of Midwest Books. Um, the, the, I'm pretty sure, I know I'm blanking out, I know Midwest something anyways. Midwest is the one of the companies that provides libraries with most of their audio CDs as well as audio books. And in some case, and in a lot of movies. Most, they mostly do movies and music as well as, yeah, and so what Hoopla provides is a digital streaming resource for these for these materials, and it's great because we've been waiting, libraries were really waiting um, a long time, to, yeah, Midwest Tape, thank you, uh, to get this resource because you know, honestly, almost five years ago, I was saying, why, why aren't we providing movies and music like Netflix does? You know, and, and the reality is Netflix, if they were smart, <clears throat> would have gotten into this business, the, the library business, and provided streaming movies to libraries. But they didn't, and I don't see that they're going to. So Hoopla, which is a great provider of libraries uh, through Midwest Tape, has created this service, which I find to be fantastic. So what does it do, and how do we do it? Again, here's the email and password, and once you create that email and password, you're going to associate with your library card, and once you do that, you're in there, and you know the nice thing about this, the, the app is not, I don't think it's the greatest right now, but it's getting better. It basically col collects um, three different material types. So you have audio music CDs, you have audio books, and then you have streaming movies. Their streaming movie collection is not 
the most current, but the exciting thing is their audiobooks and music are the most current. So in, in many cases, you can come into Hoopla and you can get music CDs that just came out. And the nice thing is you can download them to your device and they're good for a period of time depending on how your library set that up. My library has uh, set it up as 10 titles per month, so that means I can use 10 in total of CDs, audiobooks, or movies. So the all three can be um, the audiobooks and movies and music CDs can be downloaded to your device for use offline and it's so very easy to use so you can see that it has the, the three line menu set up that most apps are favoring these days you can see my email address up there you can see again Hoopla Home is basically what we were just looking at this is the home page if you went to the the browse all you can see you'd be browsing all the movies if you went to the menu lines at the top there, you'd see the other categories that are available that we'll see on a later slide. My titles is basically what you already have checked out. Those last few are help and just more information about the app. Once you get going, you can see now you don't have any content. So basically, I'm going to do a search here. And I so I put in big L. And you can see, again, like a, like a normal um, search is giving you suggestions, which is great. I choose the Big Lebowski. The nice thing is you can see here's the soundtrack and here's the movie. Once I check it out, I have the movie. It, the only thing I need to do now is click the borrow button at the top right. I can also share this. I can like it. Once it's borrowed, it's in there and I just am basically I can click on it and I'm ready to, to stream. And you know the nice thing about this is is that that's that's it. Now, if this was an audio CD or an audio book, I would see the tracks, and at the bottom of the tracks, I could click the button and download the book to the device, and so I would have it available in. And that's that's great information. Comics and eBooks. I'm I have to look into that, but thank you for that comment. I didn't realize they had comics in there. Comics is kind of the wave of the future for e-resources for, for some people, and I'm, I know I've known about some e comic e-resources, but they haven't really taken off fully yet, but that's great. So check out Hoopla if you haven't already. If your library doesn't have it, maybe ask a friend who has it. It is very cool, and it's probably coming. It's probably the wave of the future. I think that the interesting thing is a lot of libraries, when it comes to music, got into Freegal because it was the only game in town and now that we have Hoopla, Freegal, the the idea of giving away free music never sat that well with a lot of people in libraries. The nice thing about Hoopla is it really mimics the exact same model that we have been doing for 100, 100 years or more. You know, We're basically checking out materials to people for use and then we're checking it back in. Whereas free gold, most of you may know or have heard of, basically it gives people a certain amount of downloads per week or per month and they are able to keep those MP3s. So thanks for the tip on the comics. I'm going to check that out right after class today. Sorry, I keep clicking off my slides. No more questions. So let's talk a little bit about Access 360. And the nice thing about Access 360 is once you get going in here and some of you, I don't know how many people in Rails are using this resource now, but this is a resource that Rails basically started to help um, libraries of, of different sizes to, to sort of partner together to get available books, get available ebooks e in in the Rails library system. So I don't know much more about it than that, and I, that may have been a little bit incorrect, but I think that's pretty close. So in here, you're setting up your, again, your account, and this would be the same for anybody in Rails, and you can see if your library participated. 
you would basically put in your Rails ID as your library, and then you would put in your library ID and PIN. And then from there, you're really into the collection. And Rails has a nice way of doing it. It's very similar to 3M, where they have different categories or they have a browse situation where, and the nice thing is along the bottom, they do a very iOS style account. So you can see my library, you can see the browse, you can see your account, and my stuff is basically your bookshelf. And you can see here, basically I did browse and then I chose art, and then I chose free to Kahlo book. And it's very simple. You can just see the checkout button there. You can see the copies available and the copies owned. If it was not available, you could place a hold here. The only thing that is a little bit um, interesting about Rails is that you're, you're using a reader that is not actually part of the app exactly. So you're, you have to download a couple things to your device in order to use the books. But it tells you and, and indicates that it's time to do that when you go to check out and use the book. And so here basically is the first time I'm using the access reader. And you see to authorize the reader, it's asking for your Adobe ID. So we're getting back to the DRM use. And again, on the right-hand screen, Adobe ID is, is simplified quite a bit in the last five years. You basically just need your email, your password, your, your name, and, and that's all you need in there. And then you go back to the, the picture on the left and enter your information. And once you've done that, you did enter your information, your book would appear in the reader. And you can see now when I push the Read Now button, it opens it in the reader. And you can see on the right there is the first page of the book. And again, what I did now is I went to Settings. And the nice thing in Settings is you can see basically there's the text size that you can you can um, fool with. In the preferences, which is the right-hand picture, both of these things are under more, which is that right-hand button. In the preferences, you can auto-play title, you can automatically delete, you can see the different things. In the, in the left is really just the basic, you know, and again, the orientation lock, the same thing that we saw in the other apps and then you can save those settings, which makes it easy for, for everybody to figure out. So um, with audiobooks, which is nice in Rails, you can have audiobooks as well. Again, just like in OverDrive, you're looking for the headphone indicator, in the, which is the like little triangle in the top right. Once you've done that and you've checked out the book, you're actually playing that right in the app. So you can see on the right-hand picture that you have the pause or start um, indicator to listen to the book, and, and you're all set right in there, which is nice. You know, when you first um, download it, you can see the indicator in the middle picture that it's downloading, and once it's done, it's all it's downloaded. It also shows you your, your loan period and the due date of the book right there so you know how f quickly you need to read the book. I think it's a pretty clean interface, the Access 360, and, and pretty easy for people to use. I think more and more we're seeing that all kinds of apps are trying to follow a, a more similar model if they're trying to be u very user friendly. And I think for libraries, that's very important, obviously. So do we have any questions about um, Access 360 or anything that we've talked about yet? We've got a couple more little, we got, I'm just going to touch on freeing a little bit here, and then we're going to talk about some things that I think are coming for e-resources or maybe hopefully already at your library but are improving. So let's talk about freeing for a second. Freeing is the resource that is part of um, also Freegal is that company 
I can't, I'm sure somebody can tell me the name of the company that provides that. It has a name that doesn't associate much with Freeding or Freegal. Um, but the company that provides Freeding, it's a very interesting and unique model that's different from any of the other resources that we have. Library ideas, thank you. You get an A plus. Again, library ideas, no relation to Freegal or Freeding, but Freeding is very interesting. And is what what they do is, and you can see on this slide is, it's a model that each patron gets a certain amount of tokens per period, whether that's week or month, and then the tokens allow them to check out a certain amount of books. And you can see each one of these books has a number beside it, and that number is the amount of tokens needed. Now with, whoa, sorry, with the, the checkout period, what you're getting is basically you're getting the ability to check out material. All their books are available all the time. So you're never having a problem where you're needing to put a book on hold because all the books are always available. The problem is, is that as many of you know, who have seen or used Freeding, they don't have a, a lot of the books that our patrons most want to read. So they don't have bestsellers. They don't have new books really. They have a lot of nonfiction books, which most of our other resources don't. So for some people, Freeding is a great thing. We have people that are really obsessed about nonfiction, and that's what they read. And for those people, Freeding can be a really great resource. But again, they have to get used to the idea that if they're using the other ones that they only have so many tokens per month and that's how they're going to get their books. So you can see basically on the login screen it's just your library card and PIN which is nice and simple and then that takes you right in there and you can see you're logged in and from there you can see your tokens up at the top. I haven't seen a recent version of Freeding in a while, so this, this interface might be a little outdated, but I'm not sure it's that outdated. You can see your tokens used, your downloads, and you can log out. Once you, you find a book that you're interested in, you can see the number one there, and then underneath the book it says download the EPUB, and the cost is one token. Once you've downloaded it, your token will be deducted and you'll move right on and again you can see here's another one this one is a free one no tokens required so there are some in there and you can see at the top here my tokens are four used ten left and here's a list of my recent downloads in here this is kind of a nice feature because it kind of shows books I've read in the past so that's that's kind of freeing in a nutshell. It it it's uh, once you download the books, you're opening them and reading them in a freeing app. So it's it's pretty easy to use. And for I always tell people if this is a resource I have in my library that I'm currently working in, if you're a nonfiction reader, this is a great place for you to find books. If you're not, you may not end up ever using this resource. We may be getting away from this kind of a model. It's just too different from everything else, and especially because we have to realize that we want to provide the resources and the materials that our patrons want, and mostly what they want are new books and books by popular authors. So in that way, Freeding doesn't really fit into our model. <clears throat> so let's talk about the wave of the future here, and and basically, more and more what I think the wave of the future is, is the ability to see ebooks in our online library catalogs. So if the patron goes to the catalog to look up a book and they see that the ebook is available, why wouldn't they just, if they know how to use ebooks, or even if they don't, if they can read a book and get it immediately, why wouldn't they do that? You know, and, and I'm finding more and more. So my current library, 
<clears throat> has this re has this um, figured out, or we are starting the process. And you can see on the library's uh, public catalog here, you can see there's. I did a search for magicians, and I limited the search to eBooks, as you can see at the top there. And it brought up uh, two two books. The nice thing about this search is it brought up a book that's available, and you can see the checkout button there, The Magician's Lie, <clears throat> and underneath that is a book that the ebook has been checked out, and it's asking to place a request. You can see in the catalog call number, it says ebook overdrive, and then it has some other information in there. You can see that there's one available out of two, and there's no current holds, Basically, all the information to kind of go back to one of the questions earlier about OverDrive, will we be able to see the OverDrive hold list? Well, the great thing is, is this is all assimilated into one place now. So what, what we're providing is basically a way for somebody to look up a book. So even if they looked up a book, you know, let's say they looked up The Magician's Lie, the ebook would be in that list for them to look at and they could choose between large print ebook regular print audiobook hopefully uh, an e audiobook also in that way what we're doing really is is it the wave of the future or is it finally we're getting there so that you know we can all argue about that but the reality is we want ebooks to be assimilated into our normal library use just like any other material. So by doing this, we're saying that you can go to one, it's one-stop shopping. You can go to the catalog, you can find the materials you want, and you can check them out. Now one of the frustrations, why I don't think we're quite there yet, is you can see, now I'm in my library account, you can see my name up at the top right here. So when I check out the book, it says I can choose my format, and this is still in the catalog, and I can check it out now. Now one of the problems here is once a patron does this, what happens? Well, the answer to that is currently nothing happens for them in this in the in the in their world of what they're doing. So basically what is their next steps at our at our library right now? The next step is they need to go to their OverDrive app. If they haven't already set it up, they need to set it up and then the book will be in there inside the OverDrive interface in, you know, as we discussed way back in the beginning here, they have to go into the area where the, the books, they've, the checkout situation in OverDrive, the website is, and download the book there, and then the book will be put into their bookshelf that's in the app for them to read. So it, there's no indication right now of those steps that need to be taken once they hit this checkout button. So the book, once they hit the checkout button, is checked out for them, but there's no indication that tells them what their next steps are to get the book. So what's happening a lot is, I have people coming, you know, we have people all day coming to the desk saying, I just checked out this ebook, what do I do now? Or in some cases we have them saying, I just checked out this book, but it's I don't know where it is, you know. And so they they may have checked out the ebook by accident, and that's a whole nother problem. So we, we have to sort of be sensitive to this. I know it really this really depends on your ILS and how your how your ILS coordinates with these different e-resources. I know that Circe, we're, we're, we use Polaris and this is where we're at with Polaris. I know with Circe there was a situation that was coming down the pipe where when you clicked the checkout button it would actually open the OverDrive page which and or and or open the 3M page which basically is great because then it takes you right into the interface for that ebook and then you're able to know what to do and download it from there. So, you know, again, these are just it's all a learning curve and it's we're getting there slowly but surely. But I think the wave of the future is really to have all our materials assimilated into one place and to have that ease of use. We 
you know, obviously for our patrons, we want them to be able to get the materials as easily as possible. But ebooks are here to stay, so we need to make sure that those are kind of somehow assimilated into our per, our our stuff. So that's the end of my slides today. And basically, you know, we can kind of open it up to if we have any questions. We can ask questions about anything over the last pile of slides here. I know I covered the these resources pretty quickly. So if you have any questions about anything, me or someone in the the rest of the class obviously is qualified to answer, uh, feel free to type those ideas in there. You know, some more stuff that we'll be hopefully seeing in the future is, you know, different uh, assimilation of the apps into the the library. You know, I, I think that the next wave of the future, what I'm trying to say is, is that libraries' mobile apps will really need to improve. You know, so there's a lot of uh, development going on in the world of apps, but libraries are kind of falling behind in that. And, you know, like we, for instance, there's an app that, you know, different apps nowadays for, you know, these cities, the different cities we live in, where there's these little beacons that can be placed in your business or if you live in a town and the beacon, you know, basically once you walk into the store, the beacon can say, hey, you know, did you know that we have a sale today? And, you know, and that would be great for libraries. David Lee King, who works in uh, Kansas, wrote a great blog about it recently. You know, that libraries could have these little beacons and uh, mobile apps could respond to these beacons to say, hey, did you know there's a story time today? Or did you know we have a new ebook resource? Or, you know, for for any of those types of ideas, you know, basically, if the library apps were better, you know, they should have links to clearly connect all our e-resources resource, e together. And, and that would be great. I, I don't know, you know, how how assimilated they'll be in the future, but I think that 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 would that will be another sort of direction we're going to be going. So I'm not seeing any ideas in or questions in here. I'm hoping that uh, I was able to give you guys some good information today. And. With that, maybe I'll just pass it back to Louise. Thanks so much, Phil. We did have one question come in that I sent to you just now. Oh, you did. Okay. Do you see it there? Oh, yeah, I do. Okay. Oh, that's a that's that's a great question. Yeah, in in actually in our catalog and I think in other libraries too. You will see both the 3M and the and if I can go back to the slide here, what you would see in our catalog if you looked at the Magician's Lie, let's just pretend the second the second book was the same book. The indicator for 3M would be over on the right. You can see where it shows the overdrive uh, icon of the O, and the call number would say ebook 3M. And that's how you would see the two different resources. So the icon on the right would show the 3M icon, and then that person would know that they were they were downloading the 3M book as opposed to the OverDrive book. So and again, the, you know, different. This is really pretty new in the last year. So all different ILSs are are kind of trying to get it assimilated as quickly as possible and to try to figure out how well they can. They can make it work with the different resources. I think a lot of the the resources, 3M, Overdrive, Access, and um, Hoopla are all trying their best to work and and make their resources as open to this as possible because it'll just make mean more use for their resources. So I think that's great. I hope that answered your question. Anybody else? Let's see, we have another one. Yeah, that <laughs> that's a good one. I, and I, I think that's a common question from for 
a lot of our patrons too. You know, I, I think it's pretty um, easy to walk yourself through it. And, you know, a lot of what I've done sort of, and, you know, as many of us work in different libraries over time is, you know, you can always set up a new one. You know, use a, use your new work email, use an old, you know, use a personal email. And I know that for us gets confusing. What, you know, what email am I using? What account am I using? But, you know, walk through it and, and, and work to set it up again for yourself and that's going to help you to teach that person who also has the same problem. And it's pretty easy setting up the OverDrive account. So good luck with that. Wow, that's a great that's a very great and interesting question. Um, does anyone contact patrons on hold for an item in OverDrive that the same title is available in 3M? Well, I would say that probably that is that probably that <laughs> probably that's not happening. I wish that it was. I you know, and in some I I want libraries to have super customer service, and that would be over-the-top amazing customer service the the problem is is that we can't always we can't really go through our hold lists to tell people this information but you know the reality is what we can do when we're on the desk and we're helping somebody find a book and and what I tell my staff is if you see somebody's if somebody asks about a hold list and they're on, on the hold list a very long hold list go in and check if other copies are available you know so again I think what we really need to do is we need to give just like I said last week we need to give the best customer service possible if we're not being proactive and helping those people figure out what other materials they could use then we're not doing our jobs you know we really need to go in there and tell people this is what you know this is available in another in another, and again, it's an ebook too. You know, you've been on the hold list for two months for this book, but it's available as an ebook. Have you ever tried an ebook before? Maybe you should try it. You could have this book right now. You might not love it, but it will allow you to read this book. You know, and again, being proactive and giving that kind of service is what's going to keep us all in jobs, and it's what we should do to make the library a vital place. You know, we all need to just take that initiative and say, you know, we're not going to comb through the holds for all our users. Unfortunately, we just can't do that, you know, to say, hey, this book's available in 3M. I don't think any of us has the time in our daily work. But what we can do is make sure everybody is aware and available to say, hey, you, you're on hold for this book. Did you know it's available in this resource? Anything else, you guys? Thanks for the comment, Linda. Did anybody, do people find overlapping collections if they use multiple vendors? Um, that's a great question, and it, it really depends. You know, a lot of people want to stick with one vendor and really make that vendor as, as, as good as it can be and have as many resources as possible. The, the problem is, is these days is we, we sort of want to be able to have as many e-materials available as possible. And one of the reasons we all went to 3M in addition to OverDrive was not because they had titles that weren't available in OverDrive, I think, as much as we wanted to have another resource to offer people. And so that we'd be able to have books, some overlap in different collections. Now, if your library doesn't have a, an account, you know, the, the money, the budget to have those kind of resources, then you should just focus, I believe, you should just focus on the one resource and make it as good as possible. You know, one of the things that's happening now more and more is that all the resources are becoming um, more 
they're all becoming more similar. I should, I, that's an easy way of putting it. Many of you may have seen the recent announcement by Overdrive that they're getting rid of the WMV wave books. So they're going to only have MP3 books in the future. And basically what that says to me is that they realized how frustrating it was for Apple users to not be able to use those books. And they've determined that what they really need to do is have books that are available to all the, the library users. And in that way, you know, you can see that OverDrive is, is responding to the situation. And they also saw that the, the wave books were getting used less and less. So, you know, in that way, we can know that, that that resource, you know, is a good one to focus on. The thing with 3M not having any audio materials makes it less of a good choice for a library, you know, when they can choose OverDrive, which has all the different types of materials. So, you know, if it was up to me, I might go with OverDrive and Hoopla these days, you know, or three, you know, you might go with 3M and Hoopla as opposed to OverDrive. But again, it just depends on the size of your library and the, your budget and, you know, your collection manager, who's determining these things. You know, obviously we know that that gets very complicated when, you know, and we're not in the, we may not ever be in the decision-making process for those types of questions. But it's always good to understand it and know it. And if, you know, if you're in a committee, or if you're being asked for your opinion, we all have strong opinions about libraries and <laughs> it's good to be able to, to give those. So that was a long answer for a very short question, but I hope that it answered it. All right. Thanks so much, Phil. I don't see any other questions coming in. So I, um, unless you have anything else, I think we can wrap up. No, I think I'm good. Thank you very much, and thanks to everybody. It was great. Yeah, thanks so much, Phil. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Phil has given us permission to record and archive his presentation, so you'll find that on the Rails website. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today, and thanks again, Phil. Thank you, Louise. Have a great day. You too. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye.